Hello, I'm Professor George Smoot. We're beginning the third session, and this is the first one I'm not hosting, but I'm giving a talk. And I was assigned the task of talking about what's coming next. And it's actually pretty straightforward to talk about what we might do in two fields for the next 10 years, what, exactly what we'll get, we won't know for sure, but I'm thinking to give you the presentation of where we are now and what we might have to do to get to the next level because we happen to be at a, a plateau, a tremendous achievement and so forth. So if my slides are ready, I broadened my, uh, oh, I have the clicker, sorry. They let me have a bit of a beer before. <laughs> you know, just because I just did two sessions before. So the, I broadened the title to where are we now to give us an idea of what kind of an incredible plateau we've gotten to and what's coming next. And my assistant there is telling you big question mark. And, uh, but relevance, we're, we're, we're going to see that we're really trying to understand the universe at many levels. Okay, so here's a little animation that comes, that Serge should have had this morning, but I didn't get it ready in time, that shows uh, an animation we're making for a planetarium show on dark matter. And this involves Michael Barnett and people from Atlas and some incredible illustrators from that. And this is where the theorists told the galaxy dark matter doesn't exist. You see what happens to the galaxy with no dark matter. The theorist thinks, well, maybe there is dark matter because there's plenty of observations. So let's put the dark matter back in. <laughs> and there the galaxy is. And so we, we're going to make a little journey inside the galaxy and so forth. But so this is a little bit of an advertisement for this planetarium show on the dark, called The Dark Secrets of the Universe that we're putting together. So there's our sun, and uh, we're observing it, and we're doing he helioseismology on it, and that might come up later. And then we're gonna go down and find the Earth because we're all partial to that. We even like the moon a little. And guess where we're gonna come? This is a planetarium show, and so this was a flat screen version, a, a, a cutout of part of the thing, but it, it's shown in flat screen mode. I'll show you a part that uh, is meant to be projected on the dome. So we're inside the LHC. If you were good, you notice the equations on the wall. Then notice the boundary between France and Switzerland. <laughs> and now you see a proton, and you can see quarks inside of it. So this is a very good representation. And now the atlas detector and we're gonna have a collision in the atlas detector. And you see the many different planes in the atlas detector being lit up. And we'll zoom in and you'll see this is actually a simulated Higgs event. So this is to, uh, to be able to turn into a, a beautiful uh, planetarium show so that we can hopefully have millions of kids exposed to, you know, hearing about weird things like dark matter. Okay, so the big news is the Higgs boson's been found and the standard model is complete. So this is actually a huge plateau. So the designer just adjusted my slides, but I have two parts to the slide, the part on the right, which shows you the diagram of the standard model, and what I refer to on the bottom as the CERN row. That is everything that's in the bottom row, including the photon, although the photon wasn't discovered here, but a lot of the electric work was done here. This row is what CERN is specialized in, the, 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 the bosons. These others have been discovered other things. I believe there's a mistake, whoops. I believe there's a mistake on the date, one of the dates here. So CERN has to fix that. I don't think the strange quirk was found in 47, unless you count somebody saw something that might have been a lambda or something. And, uh, but I think 74 will work. But the point is, there is a completeness and a beauty to this model, although the, if you look, it's been adjusted a little bit so it all fits in a kind of a nice, in a nice way. But the other thing that you see is a quote from the director that we have found the, missing, the last missing piece, the cornerstone of particle physics, and the standard model is in some sense complete. Well, that's not quite true, but it's pretty true in certain, certain situation. And now this is a thing that spanned my whole lifetime, and I've watched and looked at it. So 
this is a true huge collaboration over space and time where very many smart people have worked very long for a long time and the standard model of particle physics started emerging in the 1970s and as new particles were discovered and new measurements were made, it was elaborated but it was basically not so changed and, but the parameters of this model got measured more and more precisely. And you'll see what I anticipated and what has begun to happen is the standard model of cosmology is making that same path, but 20 years later. So we'll see what's going on. So it's a very impressive kind of thing. And so I said, summarize what it is. I believe this is a major intellectual achievement for mankind. It shows that humans are very smart. So this is a big pat on the back to humanity. And, but it's very incredible when you think about this. If you look around CERN, see what was built to make, to make this place work, and see how many people labored for how long and what they've done. It's certainly on the scale of bearing the pyramids or the great construction projects, but this was done for knowledge and for understanding, and it was a difficult, challenging problem that you didn't know whether you have the answer or not, yet people labored and persevered until they did. And so we have reached a place that's kind of a platform, and we've completed that model, and we're in a unique place because that model seems to work. And it's not giving us good hints. And what we can hope is over the next 10 years of when LHC gets turned back on, that we'll get some additional hints. I was already hoping for some extra things to show up to give us direction in other areas. But what we have is we've completed, you know, it's like you completed a huge race, but now what are you going to do next? Right? That's, the, that's the sort of issue. So the other thing that happened, and this was running along in parallel with my colleagues working on Atlas, we were working on Planck for many years, but before that, when I was working on Kobe and so forth, all along in parallel with standard model, we've been working on understanding the universe and cosmology. And so uh, a little over a month ago, we, we released this, this CMB map from Planck, which is the third generation map of the embryo universe. It's an image of the embryo universe, but it's with exquisite precision. If you look at this color scale, the color scale goes from basically minus 500 microkelvin to plus 500 microkelvin, and the temperature of the universe that we measured is roughly three kelvin. So we're, we're looking, you know, finding, we're looking with precision of around a part in a million, better than a part in a million, and we're seeing structures on very large scales. And these structures reveal to us quite a lot about the content of the universe, the geometry of the universe, and uh, what was going on in the early times. Just compare that to where we were two decades ago, Right? So this is the Kobe DMR map two decades ago. A little fuzzy. I actually took, took this. I, I have these pictures somewhere, but I took this one off the web. I, mean, I, made, I made this particular one. But I took this off the web, and it was nice that it came out a little fuzzy. But it's a, it's a, it's a fuzzy ultrasound of the other universe. It's like looking at the surface of the sun, the helio seismology, seeing the sound waves that travel around the surface of the sun and through the sun at different levels, either cutting across in cords or down through the center and so forth. You're measuring the geometry of the sun by which the wavelengths set the, by, by the geometry of the sun and the frequency is set by the speed of sound through the sun and that depends upon the temperature and the density and the constituents of what the sun is made out of. The same thing is true of the early universe. These, these ultrasound pictures are really pictures that are of the sound that are brought to us by light, and they're the ones that reveal us the tremendous amount of information about the early universe. So the cosmic microwave background two decades ago promised us the potential for tremendous information. It has delivered on its promises and more. People have found out and thought about ways to exploit it even more and more. And it's, it's given us a really strong test of cosmology and determined its parameters with fairly good precision. That is typically on the scale of 1%. However, there's still more data coming, just like the LHC is going to run again for, for you know, presumably another good fraction of a decade uh, and provide additional information. We can hope that some new clues and stuff will come up. There's going to be additional Planck data and analysis. This was really the first result out of Planck that is a very big team. Many people haven't done analysis before. They're going to learn how to do the analysis better and understand things better. There's going to be cross feed from people outside of the community, or even though there's roughly 1,000 members. You know, when we started on Kobe, there were six people. Right? So it's the same thing as particle physics over my lifetime. I worked on a particle physics project that had six people on it. Now the Atlas has, I don't know how many thousand, and Planck is now up to 1,000. Okay. So, 
We're going to have the data from the South Pole Telescope, which is operating. And it's been operating and measuring first, you know, seeing clusters of galaxies, then the temperature anisotropies, and now in the polarization mode. Likewise, the Atacama Cosmology Telescope high in the Andes. And there are potential C and B polarization orbital missions. Lightbird is in Japan, which is probably going to go forward. CORE, which is a European proposal, may go forward at some time period. There's going to be probably at least one more CMB, that is study of the relic radiation from the Big Bang, mission flown by space agencies in order to t exploit this, this resource more. And we hope they're going to tell us things, including things like seeing the B modes of the polarization that would tell us more about inflation. But my guess, and this is where I'm actually stepping out on a limb, my guess is these are very lightly simply to tighten up and strengthen the standard model of cosmology, not to bring entirely a new set of physics into, into being, that it's going to be very similar to what's happened in the standard model of particle physics, that the precision of the measurements went to 1% and then a tenth of a percent, and all the parameters, the missing pieces were found, cross-tests were done. That's, that's what I think the mode is. We're in a cons you know, consolidation mode in both fields, and we're likely to see that continue in both fields for a while, but we can always hope there can be some other things. Now, there are other measurements going on in cosmology. We have the fortunate thing that we have the universe, but unfortunately only one universe, and we go forward to, to try and measure that, and we can hope we can discover and understand some things new. And so one of these things is the baryon acoustic oscillations. We see those baryon acoustic oscillations from the early universe, but they show up in these large-scale structure surveys, that is, people go out and map the location of millions of galaxies in the sky. The first ones you saw were the Sloan Digital Sky Survey and the two-degree field of view, and there we're mapping on the order of a million galaxies. Now we're doing about a million galaxies per year in BOSS, which is basically Sloan Digital Sky Survey 3. And you're looking for the imprint on the galaxies of those baryon acoustic oscillations, those small you know, degree scale fluctuations we see in the cosmic microwave background, the big peak in the power spectrum show up as a small peak in the galaxy cross-correlation function, right? The galaxies tend to be blown out, the matter was blown out in these huge spheres, and the galaxies, you know, because of the three dimensions, the galaxies will show up with a high correlation out there. And so you can see that, but this gives you a standard, you know, ruler with which you can measure the development of the universe over time, and you can measure understanding. Following this, we're in the process of trying to develop the Big Boss, which is the next level, going from doing a million per year to doing a few million per year, and measure and fill in the region further out, measuring the, 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 the spectra of 2.5 million QSOs, and the absorption lines of the, of the gas clouds are going to turn in the galaxies that are between them and us before the universe gets fully ionized. And then 18 million uh, you know, uh, emission line galaxies plus 4 million large luminous red galaxies. And that's going to be a way of looking how this thing behaves over time in three dimensions as well as in two dimensions as a function of that kind of stuff. So they're going to reveal additional information about what's going on. So we have a standard model, inflationary Big Bang Theory. It's to high precision, we live in a remarkably simple universe. The thing about it is, we need four things beyond the standard model of particle physics to understand the universe we're in, but when we put in the simplest version of those, we can calculate the universe, good. We can calculate the universe to within 1% and probably better. So the things we need, we need inflation, we need this early accelerating one, and you know, we're relieved that there might be a scalar uh, boson in the world because the simplest model of inflation is the only one that seems to fit. That, was, that would be, uh, you know, a scalar field might be the way. We need dark matter. You saw the example from the, the video. And we know it's not quarks. We know it's not leptons or gauge bosons. And we even know it's not neutrinos unless there's some sterile neutrino that's hiding in some sector that no one knows about. We have dark energy. We have the universe accelerating at the present time, roughly for the last, last half of its history, and we have the ascendance of matter over antimatter. If you guys were watching that video, at the beginning of the universe, there was equal amounts of matter and antimatter. You can, you can show that that's likely true. Somehow, in the end, we ended up with a part per billion more matter than antimatter, and that's question no. So, it's, cosmology is a primary empirical driver to go beyond the standard model of particle physics. The paradigm 
that, and it's a paradigm whose simplicity and parsimony, that is a so small amount of things, really closely match the observed universe. So here, I give humans another pat on the back. Humans are really smart. Sitting here at one place in space and time, we try to see the entire 14 billion year history of the universe over all, all of space, or at least all of the visible space. So again, we're doing very well. Thank you.